Um, so my name's Corey, and my talk tonight is titled, Why Do You Exist? And I'm gonna work on answering this question through a bike ride I did this summer. And with that, I think I'm ready. So this was the night my life changed forever. I was sitting in the sauna, and an older gentleman walked in. And we were talking a little bit, and I said I was graduating in May, and that I had no idea what I wanted to do. He looked at me and he said, what would you do if you had a year to live? I thought to myself, the number one thing I want to do before I die is learn to surf. So I told him, I said, that if I had a year to live, I would completely engulf myself in surfing and riding my bike down the west coast of the United States. And once he heard this, he looked at me and he said, I'm glad you know what you're going to do when you graduate. I never saw him again. I never caught his name. The following is a result of this conversation. So next thing I knew, I graduated college, and I was dropped off in the most northwest corner of Washington. And as I was leaving, my friends and family are like, this is ridiculous. Like, what are you doing? You have a trailer and a surfboard. You don't know how to surf. Like, th this is insane. And initially, it didn't really bother me too much, but eventually, I started getting more and more afraid. And the fears started crippling me. When these logging trucks pass you, it is terrifying. And I was afraid of being alone, I was afraid of getting hit, I was afraid of getting a flat tire, and I was really, really struggling. And I'm convinced that during this first week, I would have quit if it wasn't for this individual right here. Joe Fincher, he's 69 years old, and he was biking across America. And we met, and he was riding south for a couple days. And the whole time when we were rode together, he would ride in the far left, like he trusted humanity, like he trusted all these cars. And I was on the far right, like shaking with fear of death, of loneliness, of what I was doing in my life. <laughs> and eventually, through these many conversations, I was able to let go of these fears. Number one, I was afraid of being alone. Joe said, to figure out who you really are, you have to be alone. Use this time to find the pure you. I was afraid of getting hit. Joe told me that if you, that, if you let go of these things that you can't control, you won't ever live. You need to let go of them. Biggest of all is afraid of failure. Joe said, don't fail. <laughs> so then I was transformed by Joe's mentorship, and I was determined to finally surf. I didn't even surf in Washington, so I was so afraid. I met up with my friend John, and we surfed for six days together. And I didn't catch a wave, but I was out there in the water, and I was looking at the ocean. I was trying to figure out why the waves break the, w why the, waves break the way they do. And the whole time, I was super stoked, though. And then, fast forward a couple of weeks, my fears were kind of far off in Washington, and I realized that behind me I had this billboard that was a surfboard, and it was completely white. So I figured, why don't you write, why do you exist on it, and let these thousands of people that pass you start answering the question, and hopes you figure out maybe why I exist. And the first person that responded was Bill Warden, and he said that he wasted 40 years of his life always waiting for the outside world to change. It wasn't until he changed. He said, always respect nature, always be honest and truthful, always protect innocence, and always give back what you can. And then he said that his existence became clear. He's here to teach, and he's here to improve lives. Next person I met was Rand Bishop. He's a musician, author, and an activist. And he says he exists to promote um, change. And he was walking north to promote civil constructive dialogue. So he looked at me and he said, next time you meet someone's politics, don't align with yours. Don't try to change their mind. Try to change yours. Try to listen. Try to understand. The next person I met was Scott. And he's from Minnesota. He said he exists to love, serve, and forgive. And he donated to my trip graciously, and I thanked him. And as I was biking away, there was a sign. And written in Sharpie on the sign, it said, I wonder how many bikers die in this road a year. There's blood on your hands. And I thought of Joe, let go of the things you can't control. And this brings me into day 44. I was biking from Redcrest to Westport, and it was 105 degrees out, and I climbed 11,000 vertical feet in 92 miles. And the whole time I was on Highway 101, it was like a four-lane highway at this point, the heat was radiating into me. My derailleur broke at mile 50, and I proceeded to shift with my hands for the rest of the day. And I started climbing Leggett Hill, and right when I started climbing, about three hours in, I got to this turnout, and I was done. My calves, my quads, my legs, they were just beat, and I was, I was moaning in agony, I was on the ground, and I was crying, and I'm like, I quit, I'm over this. And I wanted someone to help me so bad. And that's when I realized in life, there's times where there's no one there to help you. I could either cry or I could get up and I could keep moving. And then that's when I realized that when my mind and my body are connected, it's incredible. And it became violently personal. It was me against this bike ride. It was me against this hill climb. It was me against all these people who said I couldn't do this. And I got up and I noticed there was a little bit of blood in my urine, but I picked up my bike and I kept going. <laughs> 11 hours in the saddle, I made it to camp that night. 
And after that, the trip just kind of got freakishly easy. I was in amazing shape, and I met up with Claire Rosen, who turned out to be a really good friend of mine, and she was biking from Vancouver to San Francisco. And I wanted her story to be maybe an inspiration to all the ladies in the room, because she did it by herself the whole time until we met up a couple days before she made it. Now, I met Don, and he, he says that he exists to surf. Maybe it's his chemistry, his endorphins, whatever, but he loves it. But before that, he was a business consultant, and he wasn't happy. And he moved to the coast, and he started surfing and a carpentry business. Don taught me that life doesn't have to be super complicated, and that I should make my own version of success and happiness. Now I transition into this final part of the trip, where I was biking from LA to the Mexico border. When I was, when I was up in Washington, I was battling the elements the whole time. Down here, I was battling humanity primarily, traffic. But now the water was warm enough where I could go from my bike to the ocean, ocean my bike, and I could surf a couple times a day, and I was loving it. I was surfing a lot. Day 65, to me, when I look at this photo, this is dream number one, learn to surf. It's me on a surfboard, on a wave, and it's breaking over about six inches of water, and I didn't hit those rocks underneath the water, and I was really happy about that, and learning to surf, yes. <laughs> so, bringing it now to the final part, make it to the Mexico border, day 77, just under 2,000 miles. This is my favorite photo. It's me dirty, tired, exhausted. It's me processing how I overcame those fears and those self-doubts that first week. It's me digesting how my existence changed. But what did I learn from all these people? What did I learn from biking thousands of miles? What changed? I learned that I can do anything I wholeheartedly set my mind to. I learned that my fears and my self-doubts are after my dreams and that I can beat them. I learned that what seems impossible to society shouldn't limit me, I can set my own limits. And why do I exist? I think I exist to teach. And with that, I hope you all learned something from me tonight. <laughs>